we learned about all of that in today, we get into a really interesting story which extends, the story itself really extends to all of chapter 10, and then it goes into the secondary, the second recount of it goes into chapter 11. So this is all, this is all deeply connected and I feel mixed about how far we should go today simply because of that. But we'll, we'll try to go to around verse 23, and then after that, I don't really want to do too much just because we're not going to meet next Wednesday because it's the day right before Thanksgiving, so we're not, there's no Wednesday night live meal or lesson next Wednesday night. So there will be two weeks until we get to pick this up again, so we're going to stop in a good place. But uh, let's go ahead and break, let's go ahead and read. If I can get two people to read for me. So I'm going to read chapter 10, verses 1 through 8, and then somebody to read uh, the, I guess, larger chunk, 9 through 23. Les, you want to read that first part? Yeah, I'll read Thank you. Anybody else for the second one? <laughs> I'll read Tom. it if you want me to. Well, I can. You want to, Grace? I can, sure. Yeah. We'll do that. We'll do that. There was a man in Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian regiment. He was a devout man and feared God along with his whole household. He did many charitable deeds for the Jewish people and always prayed to God. About three in the afternoon, he distinctly saw in a vision an angel of God who came in and said to him, Cornelius. Staring at him in awe, he said, What is it, Lord? The angel told him, Your prayers have been and your acts of charity have ascended as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa and call for Simon, who is also named Peter. He is lodging with Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had gone, he called two of his household servants and a devout soldier, who was one of those who attended him. After explaining everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. Now on the morrow, as they were on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. And he became hungry and desired to eat. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance. And he beholdeth the heavens opened up, and a certain vessel descending as it were a great sheet let down by four corners upon the earth, wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts and creeping things of the earth, and birds of the heavens. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common and unclean. <clears throat> and a voice came up unto him at, again after the second time, What God hath cleansed, make not thou common. And this was done thrice, and straightway the vessel was received up into heaven. Now while Peter was much perplexed in himself, what the vision which he had seen might mean, behold, the men that were sent by Cornelius, having made inquiry for Simon's house, stood before the gate and called and asked whether Simon, who was surnamed Peter, was lodging there. And while Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee, <clears throat> but arise and get thee down, and go with them. Nothing doubting, for I have sent them. For I have sent them. And Peter went down to the men and said, Behold, I am he whom ye seek. What is the cause wherefore ye are come? And they said, Cornelius the centurion, a righteous man and one that feareth God, and well reported of by all the nation of the Jews, was warned of God by a holy angel to send for thee into his house and to hear words from thee. You said 23? Yep. So he called them in and lodged them. And on the morrow he arose and went forth with them, and certain of the brethren from Joppa accompanied him. Awesome. Thank you both so much. <coughs> All right, so... Uh, we encounter this man Cornelius, and then we wrap back around to Peter, who we left in 
verse 43 of chapter 9 in Joppa with the, with the tanner named Simon. So, Cornelius is in Caesarea. Does anybody... I did you know. Does anybody know where Caesarea is? Got the cosine again. Oops. Something like that. Let's see. That kind of wraps back up around here a little ways. Uh, of course, it actually gets ended a little bit differently. <laughs> So somewhere around here, you got like Egypt and stuff down there. Does anybody want to take a shot? points of the actual map. <laughs> you get outside the three countries down here, I get lost. Yeah, right. Well, it doesn't help that I don't exactly have a uh, bunch of names on there or anything else. But, yeah, so it is, it's uh, a little bit lower than that. So I guess if this is sort of where the Sea of Galilee is, it's, it's like right around here-ish. Well, it's along the coastline, You're right about that. It's a coast, coastline city, pretty much. So, anyway, <laughs> all that to say that Caesarea was a pretty Gentile city. Um, it, was, it was one where, I guess, there weren't a whole lot of Jews, but we see this man, Cornelius, and he is described as what? Centurion. Yes, yeah, Centurion. So, was that? And devout to God. Yes, yeah, and devout to God. So he's he is a Roman centurion, and both of those things, just the location as well as his occupation, kind of lead us to believe that this is a Gentile man. Um, and the reader would assume that at this point, in starting in chapter ten. Okay, we're dealing with a Gentile. A man who is a centurion and he's in what is known as the Italian regiment. So this is kind of, well not kind of, this is the first time that we're interacting with, or the main storyline is focused around a Gentile person so far in the book of Acts. And that's really significant and it's going to be made clear as we go about the story. One thing though, some might potentially argue Probably not, but just for our sakes, what would be the only other person who we've mentioned so far or encountered so far in the book of Acts who could have, I guess from some view, been, some people might argue, have been a Gentile as well? The eunuch? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, so I mean, he was a practicer of uh, Judaism, but we don't know if he was a uh, proselyte or, or what was his situation. But from this from this um, story here, it is clear that this is really the first time that we are dealing explicitly with, explicitly with a Gentile person who is not Jewish in any way, except for what we're about to see. So, that's number one to fill in the blanks. This is the first story of a Gentile we see in Acts. This is the first story of a Gentile we see. So as a centurion, he was a pretty prominent figure. He would have been in charge of about 100 men, and that is a position of some, some power. So this is a significant uh, person. So verse 2, he and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. <laughs> That's almost 
it's quite it's quite shocking that second verse because the first thing that we read is this man's a, he's a part of the Roman army and he's a Gentile and so right off the bat you would think that he's he is a pagan in every sense and then we read that he and his he and all his family exhibit these characteristics of what many Jews would would consider to be righteousness. Uh, they, he has a lot of these elements of Jewish piety, and that's something that Gardner notes in his commentary on it. But that's that's uh, one A. We're kind of we're kind of getting knocked off the list quick here. But this Roman centurion exhibited many aspects of Jewish piety. This Roman centurion exhibited many aspects of Jewish piety. And Gardner also notes that along with uh, being God-fearing and giving generously to those in need, along with the regular prayer, kind of the only one that's really missing there is regular fasting. But the regular prayer time would have been, as we see in verse 3, it would have been about 3 in the afternoon. It would have been the regular prayer time for the Jewish people. So this man has a lot of these Jewish practices, uh, even though he's a Roman centurion. So it's a very kind of interesting figure that we're dealing with already. This is a peculiar man, to say the least. And so, uh, well, yeah, so verse 3. One day, at about 3 in the afternoon, so he was praying, about 3 in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius, as I was first really preparing for this and going through the, the passage that we're studying today. I was reading verse 3 and thinking about how this man seek is a seeker of God. I mean, he, he is God-fearing and desires to obey God and, and live, in the, live in his way as best he knows how, as far as apparently according to the Old Testament laws. And... Um, he is seeking God and, and made me think about when Jesus was talking about how those who hunger and thirst for righteousness will be filled. And we see this man who doesn't really fit the qualifications for someone who would be chosen by God. I mean, he's not a Jewish person, but at the same time, he is someone who seeks God. And, uh, and because of that, he has this encounter with one of God's messengers. Uh, he meets an angel of God and who came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared at him, verse 4, in fear. <laughs> what is it, Lord, he asked. The angel answered, Your prayers and your gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering for God. What, is it, what does this mean? What is he talking about here, this memorial offering for God? Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's, well, it, I guess it insinuates that he doesn't quite know Jesus yet at this point in time. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, certainly it is a sincere actions, these things that he's been doing, and so noticed by God. I think we'd understand it better if it just said offering before God. Yeah, you know, it's like, okay, yeah. that, that got accepted. This is an offering. The memorial part yeah. sort of throws you off, though. Yeah. What's it remembered of? Or maybe <laughs> as an offering to God, maybe... Well, we, we think of in memory as usually for someone who's passed away. Mm -hmm. But and we, we mean it's like honorary for someone who's still alive. But mm -hmm. maybe this didn't apply that way. Maybe, maybe this offering before God... <clears throat> God accepted this offering and made him think of Cornelius. Or I don't know. Mm -hmm. his, kept Cornelius in his memory. Yeah. Yeah. As my amplified says that your generous gifts to the poor have come up as a sacrifice to God. Mm -hmm. So, right. So that's interesting. So, what kind of language is that? What does it make us think of? Mm -hmm. in, in respect to the Bible. 
sacrificial offering? Like, what is, just in the general sense, like, what does that make us think of? Old Testament sacrifices. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, Old Testament sacrifices. So, this whole situation, <coughs> I've already said it, but it is very unique. It's kind of interesting because he is exhibiting these, these aspects of Jewish piety and um, he's in prayer at this regular Jewish hour of prayer and then he encounters this messenger of God and, and this angel says to him that all these things that he has been doing to, to live in God's way as best he knows how have risen up as memorial offering before God or sacrificial offering. It's a very like Old Testament kind of situation, um, conversation. And uh, I, I just, I don't know, I, I just think that's very interesting because he's dealing with a Gentile man. I mean, this is, this is a non-Jewish person. So there's, there is... I mean, this would have grasped the reader's attention greatly. Like, somebody reading this for the first time, um, as, as this letter was written, it's like, whoa, you know, what, what is going on here? This is very interesting, very unique. But yeah, so it's kind of Old Testament. And then he, uh, we, we do see, and this is 1B, it's kind of already past it, but we already talked about it. Cornelius was a man who regular, regularly sought God. I always have a problem with that word for some reason. Regularly. I just want to slur it. Regularly. Cornelius was a man who regularly sought God in his family as well. So, in verse 5 then, um, the angel says, Now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon who is called Peter. He is staying with Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the sea. So, I did show where Joppa was last week. <laughs> Probably don't remember it. This is... Hold on, bear with me one second again. <laughs> let's, let's get this. It's probably a little bit better. So, this is Caesarea. Where would Joppa be? Is that the one that's like 40 miles from Jerusalem? Yeah, so Jerusalem, right around here, and uh, I'm trying to remember if I said where Joppa was in relation to, to that last week. I can't remember. But anyway, so Caesarea is about 30 miles north of Joppa. The job is also on the coast. Because Simon, as a tanner, he would have needed, his, his uh, vocation would have dealt a lot with seawater. So he would, have been, he would have been close to the sea. Is this the same Joppa that Jonah parted from? Uh, I would assume so. A lot of these ancient cities had already been around for a long time. But you can fact check me on that later and get back to me. <laughs> I already spelled last week, or I had, or a few weeks ago, I'd already spelled Caesarea wrong, so I needed to amend that. <laughs> I'm going to be writing maps if I better spell things correctly. So, anyway, so uh, he, the angel tells um, Cornelius to send men down to Joppa because there's a man there named Simon Peter who he needs to come to him. For, for whatever reason, we're not really given the reason. The angel doesn't give him the purpose for the for the request, but he tells him to do it nevertheless. And then we read in verse seven, when the angel who spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier who was one of his attendants. He told them everything that had happened and sent them to Joppa. So, even though we don't really see the purpose for this request from God's messenger again. Cornelius has this quite frightening event because he says that he's he would he stared at him in fear in verse four, and this is a pretty shocking thing. It seemingly never happened to him before. 
he has this kind of mysterious request to go send for this man in, uh, in Joppa. And so one element that we see here, again, is Cornelius' character and how he is indeed God-fearing because he obeys what God's messenger commanded even though he doesn't fully understand what's going on yet. So he, he obeys him, and that's 1C in the fill in the blanks. He obeys God's messenger even though the reason wasn't clear yet. He obeys God's messenger even though the reason wasn't clear yet. Alright, so then it puts a brief hold on the story of Cornelius and we jump over to Peter. So, verse 9. About noon the following day, as they, were, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went, up, Peter went up on the roof to pray. So, this was an irregular hour of prayer for Jewish people, but nevertheless, maybe for something regarding Peter's ministry, caused him to go up there at that hour to pray. Uh, we don't, we're not really given the, the purpose, but that's, where he, that's what he did. <coughs> And he became hungry, Peter, he became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. So just as Cornelius was praying and seeking God and had this vision, so Peter was also in prayer, seeking God intentionally in that time and has this vision. And I don't necessarily want to read too much into that. I don't want to over-spiritualize it again. But at the same time, I think it is interesting how both of those things occurred at that time of prayer when these, when these men were seeking God. And that, uh, I think, just points again to what Jesus was talking about, that those who hunger and thirst for righteousness will be filled, that people who genuinely seek after God in their lives, um, they will, they will <laughs> I'm not saying always supernaturally meet with God in these, these miraculous ways, but certainly, they will, uh, they will be filled with uh, their, their, their uh, hunger and thirst for righteousness will be satisfied by the sanctification of the Holy Spirit. So there is a great meaning in that. And it's interesting that both of these uh, visions happened when they were, these men were praying. <clears throat> so that's number two. Peter also had a vision. Well, we're not even there in the verse yet. But Peter also had a vision during a time of prayer. Peter also had a vision during the time of prayer. So he was hungry. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven opened and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles of the earth and birds of the air. So as a Jewish man, this scene is falling before him in this vision, and this white sheet is full of what? Unclean animals. Unclean, and all sorts of forests. So there could be, there was some clean animals um, seemingly in there as well. But yeah, there's, there's all of these clean and unclean animals together, and Peter reacts, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> um, Yes, so verse 13 then, Then a voice told him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. Uh, Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. So, kind of at first glance here, it seems like Peter is really just being a good Jew. He is he's not wanting to partake in anything that was unlawful as far as the food regulations go in the Old Testament. He wanted to be righteous in the law, and he didn't want to didn't want to engage in any of that. He didn't want to kill and eat these animals that were unclean, unfit for him to partake in. And so God has this response. Well, well, this voice has a response. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. So what's going on? Like, is, is God trying to pull a switcheroo on Peter, saying, like, well, I gave you these laws, and then all of a sudden he's taking them back? Or is this the first time that we're seeing something like this command in the New Testament? 
Does anybody know? I have a guess. This is the first time we're seeing <clears throat> this in the New Testament. It has to do with all the interaction that's going to be happening with the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. To get them ready that they can partake in the meals and things. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there's some kind of connection <coughs> than just the surface level there, you think? Okay. <clears throat> All right, how about this? Uh, can I get two people to turn to Mark 7? And first person, who wants to do it, by the way? Two, two, Kathy and Jerry? Kathy, if you would go to Mark 7, uh, verses 14 through 19. And then, Jerry, if you would go to verses 24 through 30. And, uh, <coughs> Kathy, you can read yours whenever you get there. Again, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it is what comes out of the person that defiles them. After he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about this parable. Are you so dull? He asked. Don't you see that nothing that enters a person from the outside can defile them? For it doesn't go into their heart, but into their stomach, and then out of the body. In saying this, Jesus declared all food to clean. Okay. So, seems like this has already happened in the New Testament thus far, at least in the life of Jesus, and that he, he was the one to kind of initialize this idea that all foods are clean, and how he was pointing, some, pointing to a deeper purpose, and uh, how it was really what taints the hardest what makes a person unclean. And then, Jerry, if you could go ahead and read that second passage there. 24 through 30. Uh, yes, yep. Jesus left that place and went to the vicinity of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know it. Yet he could not keep his presence secret. In fact, as soon as she heard about him, a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an evil spirit came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, born in Syrian Phoenicia. She begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. First, let the children eat all they want, he told her, for it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Yes, Lord, she replied, but even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And he told her, for such a reply, she <coughs> may go, the demon has left your daughter. She went home and found her child lying on the bed, and the demon gone. Thank you. Thank you both. Okay, so, this is, this is pretty interesting, <coughs> and it gives us an insight into what we're reading here in chapter 10 of Acts. So we have seen already that Jesus has indeed declared that all foods are clean. Um, so this is not unprecedented in verse 15 here when the voice spoke to him a second time, saying, do not call anything impure that God has made clean. And then uh, we also see that, kind of as Darla, you were mentioning a little bit, how there is a connection between these dietary laws and, and Jesus speaking on that and clean and unclean people groups. So there's a, there seems to be a direct correlation, and at least in that instance, and we will, we're about to see it here as well, because in the first, the first uh, passage, Jesus was talking about the dietary laws um, and uh, food regulations, and then right after that, right after that instance in Mark, we see that Jesus is dealing with a Gentile woman, and, uh, and that he heals her daughter. He, he uh, of the of the demon possession and so it's like it's almost like jesus is saying you know the declaring all foods clean was kind of this, the the lesser thing and then he's then he's dealing with the gentile woman who is an unclean person and saying like okay he is he is engaging these people who are not jews and then in this instance in chapter 10 um 
the vision is about these dietary laws, these food regulations, and that's what Peter seems to, in the vision, that's what he, that's the way he responds, saying, like, you know, I'm, I'm not going to partake in this. But the voice says, do not call anything impure that God has made clean. And we're about to see Peter engaging with Gentile people, a Gentile family. So there, there is kind of a correlation that has already happened thus far in the New Testament. And uh, that kind of helps us understand a little bit more about what's going on here and the connection in, in this illustration between the, the food, food laws and then um, nationalities like Jews and uh, the formerly unclean Gentiles. Okay, uh, let's see here. Oh, yeah, that's 2A, fill in the blank. The Old Testament dietary laws had already been cleared by Jesus. The Old Testament dietary laws had already been cleared by Jesus. Okay. Continuing on in verse 16. So this happens three times. So this vision that Peter experiences happens three separate times, and immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. Or this this uh, this message in the vision happens three times. So, what's the significance of that? It's kind of a smaller note, but why is why is that important? Why Luke thought it necessary to say that this happened three set three times? I'm going to take a guess at this, but going back to you know how Christ restored. Peter, after he had denied, mm. um, you know, he said, "Feed my sheep three times." And he said, "Do you believe whatever?" Yeah. Yeah. You know how well I memorize scripture. So, like, you know the story. <laughs> no, I, no, I, that was a good recall. I hadn't thought about that story. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. But it, it took him three times to restore Peter, or it didn't take. But he you chose to do you know, yeah. three times to restore Peter. <coughs> so I think, in some sense, here it might be paralleling that and saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is that's very interesting. I, I honestly hadn't thought about that. Um, hmm. So what I'll is just think about that. Yeah. So what is it? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'm changing my mind now. <laughs> no. Uh, I, was, I was thinking the Trinity, but I like Susan's answer better. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, th I mean, you're both along the same lines as what I was thinking about and how three is a number that is presented multiple times, many times in the scriptures. And it's because three is a very significant number. It symbolizes fullness, um, completeness, harmony. Um, it's a good number. It represents a good thing, along with seven uh, and twelve. Um, so that's, I think, there's some there's some significance there. Like I said, that might be a smaller thing to note, but Luke notes it, and so we can pay attention to it as well. This happened three separate times, so there's a number of completeness there, completeness there. But also, what's interesting is that something we won't get to today is that um, Cornelius's account about his vision. He it is told three times as well. Like it's, it's, it doesn't say that, Luke says, this doesn't happen three times to Cornelius, but what's interesting is that it is stated in chapters 11, 10 through 11 three separate times. So that's kind of unique. So it, there seems to be maybe some connection there. But anyway, this happened three times, and immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. So while Peter was wondering about the meaning of the mission, the men sent out... The men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. So, similarly to Cornelius' position, Peter doesn't really understand what's going on quite yet. I mean, he, he's had this miraculous thing happen to him and uh, had this vision, but there's not necessarily a solution presented or further discernment to what's going on. But that's where he is. He's wondering about it. And at the same time, these men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. Verse 18, they called out, asking if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, the Spirit said to him, so there's some further explanation. 
Simon, three men are looking for you. So get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. So there is a little bit, like I said, a little bit more follow-up about what's going on, but he's still kind of in the dark. I mean, all, the, all that he's really been told to do is... What was that? Three men. <clears throat> Three men? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Man! <laughs> well, you didn't need to go that deep on this. Yeah, three men. Maybe there's something. There. Uh, that's cool. But yeah, so there's there's a little bit more explanation about what's going on. Well, there's explanation on what to continue to do, not so much as what the purpose of all this is. But God wasn't necessarily. It seems like God wasn't necessarily looking for them to really understand the whole purpose of this just yet. But it was to obey, um, to. Be like, okay, and uh, take the steps that, that God had ordered them to do. And so far, they both have. Verse 21, Peter went down and said to the men, I am the one you were looking for. Why have you come? The men replied, We have come from Cornelius, the centurion. He is a, right, he is a, a righteous and God-fearing man who is respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him to have you come to his house so that he could hear what you have to say. So then Peter invited the men into the house to be his guests. So there is a little bit of clarity here brought by these men's explanation of uh, the, why they've come. And Peter's wheels probably are turning just enough to where he's, he, he probably understands the significance. I mean, we see later how he does when, he's in, when he interacts with Cornelius and all of his family. But... There's some connection being made here. He's like, okay, I've had this vision about all these clean and, and unclean animals, and uh, voice saying, do not call anything impure that God has made clean. And then these Gentiles, these unclean people, have come to me who say that there's this man who is who is over them, who is God fearing, and uh, he is a righteous man, which is a very bold thing to say <coughs> to a Jewish person. There's a righteous Gentile who is a uh, very God fearing and. And, uh, but, it's, but they've backed it up with God sending a messenger to this righteous Gentile. A holy angel told him to have you come to his house so that he could hear what you have to say. So Peter probably does understand some of the connection here, but maybe not the full understanding of what would, what would, uh, what would come of his going with these men. And then he does show a step of progress, and he welcomes these Gentile men into his house, which is a significant thing. He knew they're not Jews, but he welcomes them in nevertheless, and uh, that was a show of progress. So I'm at a, I'm at a, uh, I'm stall here because I don't, I don't really want to go on because the next section is really very fluid until the very end of chapter 10. So we probably won't. So let's just reflect a little bit about what we've studied so far tonight, and we can break it down and maybe think about some application together. So what has made this story fairly unique so far in the book of Acts? Acts 1, yeah. But I will after you get somebody who gives me an answer. Cornelius was the Gentile. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. <clears throat> and Peter was given permission, given permission to start eating things that he was raised to believe on clean. Mm hmm Yeah. <laughs> Maybe he did, and he was just being legalistic or something. I don't know. Maybe he forgot. <clears throat> Maybe he did forget, but. Well, I think it's, you know, like anything, when you grew up with a belief, mm -hmm. it's really hard to change. Yeah. You know, no matter who tells you, you know, that's how, you know, that's been so ingrained in you. Mm -hmm. And by people you trust, usually. Yeah. And it's hard to change those little habits. You know, you feel like you're a traitor, you know, in a sense, yeah. you know, to what you believe. You know. um, but 
that's also a broader lesson with this is, you know, the things that we grow up with may not always be right. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't mean that they're wrong, but it's because I think there is kind of an in between there. But, yeah. you know, we carry a lot of our belief systems into and, and put it into the Bible. Yeah. And we need to be careful about doing that. Right. Uh, just because that's what you grew up, you know, that's how you grew up doing it. Mm -hmm. Doesn't yeah. mean or believing that doesn't mean that it was right. That's actually biblical. Right. So you know, just like we say, you know, the message doesn't change, but how the message is presented, you know, has changed through technology, through culture, through everything else. But the message itself doesn't change. Mm -hmm. But yeah. a lot of times, as we get older, especially, we like things done the way we are comfortable with, <laughs> and. Yeah. And the older we get, the more, the, more, the less like we're, like we want to change. We kind of get hard in that because mm -hmm. uh, we, at some point you get resistant to it. Yeah. yeah. You might, to something you might entertain when you're younger, when you're older, you kind of count on because yeah. you want stability. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's. And it's when our comfortableness, for lack of a better word, interferes with spreading of the gospel. That's where we really need to take take note and make sure that our comfort is not hindering the spreading of the Word of God. Yeah. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, those reasons might have been why Peter responded the way he did to the, to the site before him of the clean and unclean animals, maybe so. Um, but also, I mean, along with that, there's other, there's other examples of that in Scripture. I think of Jesus and the Sabbath and, um, how the Jewish leaders were so appalled at how he treated the Sabbath because you know he let his uh, disciples work. Uh, when he points out that the deeper truth of the Sabbath was, you know, there's it's not supposed to be this this super legalistic thing where it's like, well, as long as I just follow the rule, I'll be okay. But I mean, he says the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath, and. Uh, um, but that was a very shocking thing to all the Jewish leaders because in the Old Testament, you, you know, you read through the whole Old Testament and what's emphasized time and time again is the Sabbath and how important it is and how strict of a regulation it is and for, the, for the people of Israel. And they were not to break it under any circumstances. And anybody who did would be punished severely. Like there, were, there were immense consequences. So to hear that from Jesus, I'm sure, was very shocking. Similarly, these, these dietary laws, they were kind of, maybe not quite, but almost along the same weight. Uh, and they, that would have been really hard to hear for a lot of these Jewish people who had grown up with these strict laws. Uh, and to, <laughs> to hear them say that. And it's easy for us to sit on this side and not having been Jewish or underneath those strict yeah. laws to be like, well, that was, you know, why didn't they just accept what Jesus said? It's not <laughs> But if you've been told all your life that is wrong and you are, you know, yeah. and you are sinning against God or whatever term they would have used, you know, what to do. Yeah. yeah. That would be so hard to, you know, change mind and go, oh, that is okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Now, it wasn't all that long ago for us that are older that, you know, the Catholics could start eating meat on Friday. That it wasn't fish, and that shocked everybody when, you know, that was changed. That's true. Very resistant to change. Everybody, anybody who says otherwise is probably lying. <laughs> <laughs> uh, or maybe they just walked through some stuff we have. But we'll, uh, those last uh, two, two fill in the blanks there. I'll give you those. Good job. Thanks for thanks for answering me your reward now. To be, Peter was also obedient to God, though he did not fully know what was to come. Peter was also obedient to God, though he did not fully know what was to come. Cornelius was too. He was, which is amazing, isn't it? And he, he did what he was told to do. Mm -hmm. He sent other centurions or soldiers to go and find him. Yeah. Yeah. Peter at least got a clue yeah. before he got sent. 
Yeah, yeah, that's right. He's he, he got like as he got a follow up, <laughs> second opinion, and then uh, Cornelius just had the one vision. And but he he did what he was told. He did. He wasn't even Jewish. It's pretty pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Number three, Peter was welcomed by an expectant. Uh, no, that's oh, for that's next week. <laughs> That's for two weeks away. Don't worry about that. <laughs> Fold it in half right there. That's right. Cut it off. Don't worry about it. Pass out scissors. Um, <laughs> I, forgot, I forgot that I had one. That was like just in case we had gotten that far, but we're not going to. So I think we've already talked a little bit about it, but what, what can we learn from this passage that, that uh, we read so far? Did, or did anything jump out to you? Maybe it's something we've talked about yet or, or not. Follow God's lead. God tell you what to do. Mm -hmm. you got to listen. Yeah. Yeah. And certainly, you know, it would probably be one thing for probably wouldn't be very helpful for us to expect, like, well, I'm not going to do anything unless God comes to me in vision and tells me exactly what to do. Uh, because in a very real way, he's already, he's already told us what to do, right? He's, we, have, we have his word. We have uh, what we know is in his will, and so we have our, we have our marching orders in a sense. I mean, you see Peter here and how... You know, conflicted he was with the whole vision that he had with these unclean animals and stuff. And yet, you know, he was with Jesus when Jesus, uh, you know, spoke to the Samaritan woman. And in a lot of ways, the Samaritans were despised more than Gentiles were. And, yeah. Uh, uh, so it should have been a real shock to Peter that that the, the Lord was going to going to have mercy on the Gentiles as well, mm -hmm. uh, because you know they were. When Jesus was speaking with the Roman, they were afraid to even say anything to him, like, you know, because they none of them liked it. Yeah, uh, I'm sure they didn't even want to walk through that region. And right. yet, through his testimony with that woman, that woman goes and and converts her entire village. She convinces them that Jesus is the Messiah, mm -hmm. and and that lesson should have been in the forefront of Peter's mind that you know the Lord can work through anybody. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that just shows how finite we are. I mean, we, you know, we might, I, it's easy to sit here and think about the Old Testament where the children of Israel was, you know, were wandering through the desert and they kept doing the same things. Well, how could they forget? Well, they forget. Yeah. No, you're right. You're right. And something we easily forget as well is just how revolutionary of a time this was and how many many things were changing during this period of time with Jesus coming. I mean this was this was the arrival of the Messiah, the long awaited one, um, who Israel had waited for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years for. And all of a sudden he's here and he is not quite what they expected. And uh, there was some change in that and Understanding that God's kingdom is, He didn't come to establish it on earth. He, he came to establish His kingdom in heaven and on the new earth. And all of the different commands, I mean, some we already talked about with being Sabbath. Um, we can mention um, circumcision, uh, the Gentiles being welcomed into the family of God. Just as equal, I mean, Paul says neither Jew nor Gentile, right? So there's these people are treated as equals, are valued as equals under God's, as God's family, one and the same, essentially. Um, this is an incredibly revolutionary time, and in, you know we've lived as many of us Christians for decades who have just kind of been on the one track, just growing maturity towards God. But a lot of this is was very new to all of them, and so some of the hesitancy that we see is uh, <laughs> maybe we should give them more of a break than we, uh, than we might be tempted to do. But very significant time. Any, any last uh, little thought there before we finish for tonight? It kind of just 
makes you feel like he's sitting on that for something bigger because he's telling Peter to go back to Cornelius' house. Yeah. yeah. Which, yeah, for a Jew to go and be welcomed into a Gentile's house is a no-no. But that last uh, there in 22, it says the holy angel told him to ask you to come to his house mm. so that he could hear what you have to say. <coughs> so. Yeah. Kathy, you're, you're, you're all over the right track. I hope you're here in two weeks. You can, you can help us along. As we finish this story, it's a, there's some really good stuff upcoming. It's, it's a, a lot, a lot of, well, I mean, it's the Bible, so it's, <laughs> it's good. But there's, this is a very significant event in Acts. I mean, it's one of the, one of the huge ones. So we'll, uh, we'll uh, conclude this chapter. It'll be a lot, but we'll, we'll get more work through it in two weeks here. So that'll be the, uh, no, it won't be two weeks. Oh, boy. Because, will it? Yeah, the 30th, that we had... 30th of November is two weeks from now. Okay. okay. I, can't, I thought for some reason that we had uh, caroling two weeks from today. But that's not until three weeks. All right. Well, we only have two more lessons after this together for this year. But uh, we'll meet on the 30th. I think I guess that's what that is. And then we'll meet on the 14th. So, thank you all so much. And uh, appreciate your input and your discussion and your attention. Uh, Bill, would you mind closing us in prayer this evening? Okay. You got to thank you for this time tonight where we can be together and uh, <clears throat> Luke is teaching us. We uh, just ask you to keep us safe as we make our way to our homes. Thanks for that, Jesus. Name, right?